Good morning and welcome back to the Monday study group. We are in Acts chapter 17 and uh, I think the entire focus of our uh, conversation this morning is going to be on my computer's doing funny things. All right, yours does too probably. Things you don't ask it to do, it just does. Um, yeah, so our, our entire conversation probably today will be on Acts 17 and Paul's speech at the Areopagus. And that's where the in-person group ended today. We did not get into chapter 18 at all, although I think I've sent you study questions for chapter 18. If you don't have them, uh, send me a, an email. You have my email address if you're getting these videos. And uh, I'll be glad to send the study questions for chapter 18 again. All right, uh, let's begin with prayer as we normally do. We can't do this without God's mercy and grace. So that's what we ask for, Lord, that you would be with us, guide us, help us. Uh, we will use the powers, the reasoning, the emotions, the feeling, the sensitivity that you've given us. We'll try to listen well to listen especially to what your your word is saying to us in the book of Acts. Um, and we pray that uh, through what we hear today and read, that your good purpose for our lives might be advanced. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, last time we noted that Paul had walked through Athens, had seen uh a variety of images there, altars, uh, statues of various deities, and that uh, he had uh, been speaking both in the synagogue, chapter verse 17 of chapter 17, but also to those outside the synagogue with various philosophers like Epicureans and Stoics. And I'm sure there were Platonists as well. Um, the atmosphere of the city of Athens at this time was uh, one in which philosophy and religion played a very important role in the everyday lives of people. And people believed that their human lives were somehow subject to powers outside themselves. Uh, spiritual powers, sometimes negative spiritual powers, to forces they had no control over, and especially fate, uh, in which many people believed that their destiny was already decided by the sign under which they were born, uh, and there was nothing they could do about it. This is one of the reasons why I think Christianity appealed so much to, and the mystery religions, uh, both the Christianity and the mystery religions, appealed so much to people because they offered a sense of escape and liberation and salvation from the powers that were dominating the lives of people and especially the idea of fate. Neither the Epicureans nor the Stoics believed in a personal life after death. Uh, at best, in Greek philosophy at this time, people believed in the immortality of the soul. Uh, they believed that the soul would separate from the body at death and the soul would go to be in the spiritual realm. And very little was known about what might happen in the spiritual realm. Lots of theories and philosophies and religion developed about, around the idea of what occurs in the afterlife. But the Epicureans and the Stoics here, um, neither of them were active believers in a personal life after death. The Stoics believed that we would be reunited with the divine realm, um, which was a part of us, that a spark of divinity resided in human beings and that that spark of life and eternal presence would go and back to where it had come from and be reabsorbed back into the divine. And the Epicureans, for the most part, believed in the dissolution of the atoms of the body and that there would be no consciousness 
after death, our, that our body would just be dissolved and become part of the elements. The Platonists, although, uh, and they, they were a major force, the Platonists believed in the immortality of the soul, that the body itself, during our lives, the body was basically negative. It, it weighed us down, dragged us down. The body was felt to be the prison of the soul and that thankfully at death you would be liberated from the uh, weight and influence and negative uh, drag of the body and the soul would be liberated to a better life. Um, and so uh, it would be very common for people to believe in the liberation of the body and the, the liberation of the soul from the body and the immortality of the soul. We came from the divine realm. We are going to return to the divine realm. But it was largely unknown and therefore open to lots of speculation. Paul, knowing, I think, all this, Paul was quite well versed having grown up in the diaspora and apparently well educated, uh, was well aware of the philosophies of the time and of their the different worldviews that were present in Athens. He starts uh, by trying to find points of contact with his audience here. He's not speaking in the synagogue. He's at the Areopagus, and he's speaking largely to people from this pagan, polytheistic, uh, multi-philosophical uh, worldview. He says that when he was walking through Athens, he perceived the religiousness of the Athenians and the evidence of that was the v variety of altars and statues and memorials of various kinds in honor of uh, a variety of gods and goddesses. And so he says, as he went through the city, looking carefully at the objects of your worship, that is, these altars were ways of connecting people to the unseen spiritual realm, uh, that you could, uh, by offering your gifts and your sacrifices, have some connection to the unseen spiritual realm, objects of your worship. Uh, Paul saw an altar that said, <clears throat> to an unknown God. And so he uses that as a nice rhetorical device to launch into an explanation of God as Paul understood God, but in a way that drew the pagan audience, the Greek philosophical background audience that grew that that drew that audience into his thinking and into his point of view, and was trying. Paul was trying to make it possible to f to find common ground, at, in so far as he could with his audience. So let's observe what he does. He uses this device of an altar to an unknown God to say that what you worship as unknown at this altar, I will proclaim to you, I am proclaiming to you. The God, and then, so what is he going to say about God? Who is this unknown God? Well, this is not just going to be another one of the gods of the Greek and Roman pantheon. This is going to be the God who created all things. So he universalizes God. He doesn't localize God in terms of one of the gods or goddesses of the pantheon. He says, I am talking about the God who made everything there is. The God who made the world and everything in it. The, the Lord of heaven and earth. The one true God. This would not be a foreign idea. Uh, it would be different from polytheism, but there was this sense in some part of Greek culture that there might be the one God, the true, the God of the true, the good, and the beautiful, the unifying God of all reality. And so Paul is saying here that it's this God, the God who made everything, who is the Lord of heaven and earth, and who is not localized in some shrine or at some altar, maybe even 
the temple in Jerusalem, though this is not a part of the talk that he gives here at the Areopagus. But Paul is saying that God is so great uh, that he created all things and that he is the sovereign Lord of the whole universe, of all the heavens and the earth. And so it's obvious that if that's who God is, he doesn't dwell in shrines made by human hands. Uh, he is not resident in altars or at uh, little temples or things that people have built and say there is God. Uh, this includes the temple in Jerusalem, I think, in Paul's theology now, but uh, he's not going to get into that part of it here. He's going to say that it's obvious that if this is who God is, this God does not live in shrines made by human hands, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. This is a God of grace. This is a God of mercy. This is a God of beneficence and bounty who created all things and is not served by us. He's not doesn't need us to serve God uh, as if God were somehow dependent for his happiness and well-being on our actions of altering him flowers or fruit or uh, animal sacrifices on an altar. No, in fact, it's the other way around. God comes to us. We don't come to God. God has already come to us. He has made everything he, his, he has given us to all people. Notice how Paul universalizes the audience, too. He's saying all mortals, not just Greeks, but Jews and people in other parts of the world that uh, they know are out there, but they don't know them. Whoever they are, if they are human, they are the object of God's goodness, of God's bounty, of God's favor. And he has given to all mortals life and breath and all things. So he not only universalizes God as the Lord of all things, applying to all people, but he then goes on to universalize all people and not to make distinctions like the Greeks did between the Greeks and the barbarians or the Jews did between the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, other people make distinctions between humans in order to make their own tribe or their own ethnic group more special. Paul said, no, from one ancestor, God made everything there is. And so he's emphasizing uh, the unity of the human race. He made all nations, not just Rome, not just Greece, not just Israel. He made all nations on the face of the whole earth. I really like this sense that God, that Paul has both universalized God as the Lord who created all things and is over all as Lord of heaven and earth. <clears throat> but he also universalizes human beings to say we are all the same. We are all come from a common ancestor. He has created us all as one, one uh, people, as it were, and he has allotted to us the times of our existence. That is, we, didn't, we don't control when we're born or when we die. Uh, he has allotted to human beings the time of their existence, and he has set the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they uh, are people who are uh, engaged in the culture and place and time where they are and that that has shaped their identity and that this too is a part of God's good plan for human beings that God has set the boundaries of the place where they live and God has done all this, created all this so that, notice the purpose clause here in verse seven, in verse 17, sorry, 27, verse 27. He's done all this for the purpose that, in order that, they would search for God. This is a profound statement that St. Augustine also picked up on when he said that God has made us for God's self. That is the very purpose of our existence, 
it has been determined by God that we would belong to God. God has made us for a relationship with God and our hearts are restless until we find our rest in God. Uh, and Paul says basically the same thing here, that he has made people so that they would search for God. They were made to seek God, to know God. He made us so that they would search for God and perhaps reach out in various ways and grope for him and find him. Though, he's talked both about searching, seeking, groping, but ironically, God is not very far from any one of us, for in God we live and move and have our being. We have our very being in God. And so God isn't far from us, but and God made us for a relationship with God's self. He even goes so far, Paul does here, to say that you know this from your culture because even some of your poets have said, we too are God's offspring. That is, we have a natural relationship with God. Paul, if, if he were speaking to a, a group with Old Testament background, with Hebrew Bible background, he would say that, you know, we have been created in the image of God. So in that sense, we all have a likeness to God. We are God's children in that sense, God's offspring. So then he draws a conclusion based on this teaching about who God is, the universal God, and who we are, people who were made to seek God and know God and to reach out for the God who surrounds us and is already so present to us that we live and move and carry on our lives inside the presence of God. Yet we may not be aware of that because our seeking takes the form of groping and searching as if we didn't yet know God. So Paul says, if all this is true, since we are in fact God's offspring in some sense, because God created us to be like God, we ought not to think that God is, un, is like an object of gold or silver or clay or rock that we fashion to look like a God. If God is like us, if we are human beings, our offspring of God, then God's not like something made by human hands, like metal or stone, anything like an image formed by the art or imagination of human beings. No, God would be more personal, alive and personal and real, like each of us is alive and real and personal. Because we are God's offspring, we have some clue to the nature of God as personal. <clears throat> So, then Paul moves to a kind of climax in his talk, different from what his, his climax would be if he were talking to a Jewish audience in the synagogue. There he might be talking about Abraham and his faith and his, uh, his evidence of God's action in his life in preserving Isaac. And, and yet Abraham's faith in doing what God had commanded him to do. He hasn't talked about Moses, has he here? He hasn't talked about the law. He hasn't talked about sin uh, yet. He hasn't talked about sin. He hasn't talked about David and a Messiah like David. None of these concepts from the Old Testament are present in this talk. This is a talk directed to people who do not yet have that background and knowledge of God that is there in the Hebrew Bible. And so he says to them that this God, whom he has described as the Lord of heaven and earth, and we as mortal human beings who have been created to know God and to search for God and to discover the God who is very close to us, the God in whose image we have been made because we are in a sense like God we are God's offspring. His, his conclusion is that this God 
in times past has overlooked human ignorance about who God is, that God let people go their own way. But now God has acted decisively in a man, in a person, whom he has appointed as the judge of all things. Here's how Paul says it in verse uh, 30. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands people everywhere, not just Greeks and Romans, but Jews and people living in India and China and, and in pagan Europe and up in Germania and Britannia and anywhere else that there may be human beings, God has commanded every human being to change their life, to repent, to turn away from false gods and idols and inadequate ex expressions of the nature of God, to turn away from all that and to turn away from doing what is wrong, judged by even by their conscience, since they don't have the law of God to go by, everyone has conscience, and, and yet people violate what their conscience tells them they should do or should have done. And so Paul says that God has overlooked in the human ignorance, but now he commands people to turn from that which is inadequate, and is not a good expression of how God wants us to live our lives. And that this call to repentance of all people, not just the audience Paul's talking to here at the Areopagus, but all people, including Paul himself, God has called us all to turn from are inadequate ways of living. He doesn't even mention sin here. But it might be in his background, yet he's not using that term because it might not communicate well with this audience. But he says people need to turn away from what's wrong. Why? Because God has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged. So there's going to be a judgment day. There's going to be accountability, Paul says, for how we all have lived our lives before this one God who created the heavens and the earth and is Lord of all and has given us life and breath and all things out of his grace and mercy. How have we lived our lives? Have we sought after this one God? Have we lived to know God? Have we lived to live in accordance with the nature of that God, which would include, as we know, loving God and our neighbor as ourself. God will hold all per persons accountable, and there will be a day on which he will judge all people, and he will judge all people in righteousness, that is, in justice. Righteousness is God's fierce determination to put all things right, and it's by the standard of divine correctness or rightness that we can judge what is right and wrong. There will be that ultimate final standard of right and wrong, though people on earth differ in terms of their understanding of what's right and wrong. There is an ultimate final uh, absolute standard of right and wrong, and that's the nature and character of God. And God will judge the world by this one whom he has appointed. Notice he doesn't even say Jesus Christ or the Son of Man or the Messiah. He just says a man whom he has appointed and he has shown that he has chosen him and given us assurance of this by raising him from the dead. This would have uh, confounded Paul's audience, and perhaps he knows that, because he knows that in Greek culture, the resurrection of the body isn't helpful. You don't want the body back. You want the immortality of the soul. You want the liberation of the soul from the body. So what is this resurrection of the dead? 
why do we want back this corrupting human body that has been the source of pain and and evil desires and has caused us so much trouble in our lives why would we want that back paul says uh, the athenians say to paul but paul says god raised this man from the dead something that has never happened in the history of the world he raised this person from the dead to show that this person was the one whom he had chosen to judge the world in righteousness amazing talk here isn't it nothing about christ dying for our sins on the cross there is the resurrection and there is that he is the judge of the living and the dead but nothing here about atonement uh, doesn't mean paul doesn't believe in it and it doesn't mean that in part two of the talk that paul would perhaps have given at the areopagus he wouldn't have described human alienation from god and the restoration to a right relationship with God that God provided in and through the sacrifice of Christ. Um, but that's not where he starts here. He tries to find terms that are applicable to his audience, that, that touch common ground, the highest common ground he can find, the most moral, the most spiritual common ground he can find with his audience, and to persuade them that they should turn from inadequate concepts of God to the God who made them and who is not far from them and who created them in order that they might know and love and serve God. Well, we don't know what the result was. The results as Luke presents them are pretty dim. A few people, when they heard that Paul talked about the resurrection of the dead, they scoffed. Why would we want that? We don't know what he's talking about. But other people said, well, we need to hear you again about this. This is a bit attractive and it's a bit confusing. We need to hear more. But at that point, Paul left them. And he doesn't, we don't know that he ever spoke to the Athenians again. Because chapter 18 begins with Paul leaving Athens and go to Corinth. Now, a few people did believe, it says, at that point, Paul left them, but some of them joined him and became believers, believers in Christ. And presumably they would have been further taught about who this man was that God had appointed to judge the living and the dead. They became Christians and would have been subject to further teaching. And these uh, believers included two people that are known to Luke, and known to other early Christians. So he names them Dionysius the Areopagite and Damaris, a woman, and others, un unnamed by Luke, and he doesn't know them. Now, from early Christian tradition, it is believed that this Dionysius the Areopagite, the one who participated in the discussions at the Areopagus, this Dionysius became not only became a Christian, but he became the first bishop of Athens. And so, according to tradition, there was a Christian community at Athens. But the New Testament, insofar as it goes, knows nothing of a church at Athens. They just know of a group of people who became Christians as a result of Paul's ministry, this brief ministry that Luke has described here in chapter 17 of the book of Acts. And so Paul moves on. He moves on to Corinth. Uh, it doesn't say he went back to Athens and spent any time there like he did at Ephesus. And he's going to go on to Corinth where he apparently spent more time than he spent anywhere else uh, in his ministry. So we will pick up with Acts chapter 18 next time and see how Paul has moved on to proclaim the good news of the gospel in another Achaean, southern Greek city, uh, a port city uh, that was infamous in the ancient world for its licentiousness and liberality in terms of morality. So uh, we'll reflect, we, we have the letters of Paul to, the, to Corinth and that will give us some further background as we read about Paul's ministry in Corinth next time. 
Thank you again for being part of the Monday study group. I hope you are using your commentary. I can only get uh, through a few things, but um, I've been using uh, David Williams' commentary in the in the New International Biblical Commentary, which is now published by Baker. It was published by Hendrickson. Uh, this is the same series that my own commentary on the letters of John is in. Uh, and it's a fine commentary, uh, this commentary on Acts by David Williams, and gives quite a bit of background without going into massive detail. Uh, I noticed that some people in our study group are actually using a more detailed and in-depth commentary by F.F. F. Bruce on the book of Acts. And that's also a very fine commentary. I hope you're using some resource to get, enable you to go deeper, um, but we're providing some study questions that might lead you to, to consider more and study more in the passage and go deeper. And you're also perhaps using a study Bible uh, which has footnotes and maps and other resources that can help you uh, understand the scripture better. And I hope that our talks on Monday uh, provide some background and uh, enhance our understanding of what Luke has done here in writing about the rise of early Christianity. Have a good week. Keep one another in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, it's a difficult time in our world. Pray for peace and the release of the hostages, all of them, uh, and for peace in the Middle East and Ukraine and in the Sudan and Kosovo and other places where violence is threatened. Take care.